this was a study that started really around the turn of the century, around 1999-2000. And, um, oh, I, I, um, and look, the, our first funding for the planning stages of the study was this organization. And you'll see them in the bottom right-hand corner. We ended up getting MDA and NIH money, uh, federal money, to support the study. But it's, it started here as far as a, plan, a planning grant. All right, so I'm going to go through this. Why did we even try to pursue uh, uh, this study, which many people had tried to do in the past? Um, how we ended up doing it, and what were the results, and so why? And I think some of you in the audience may uh, have heard of Dr. Blaylock. He's there on the third bullet point, who was a surgeon in Baltimore, actually. And um, he started doing thymectomies, removing the thymus gland, in patients who had a tumor, who had a thymoma. Um, and um, in this first case report, he actually reviewed a couple of prior attempts to influence myasthenia gravis by surgery. And in those days, this is back around World War II time as it was getting started. Two patients got better, two died in those prior reports. But he described this woman, this 21-year-old woman who did have a tumor, and she had been really difficult to control before that. And after the thymectomy, he was able to stop the prostigmin, which is um, in that era, the mestinon that was used in that era, it's an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And as you'll see on the next slide, she had a very long state of remission. She really got better. You can read the quote at the bottom because this was a question that remained, though, both for patients and doctors for decades. What real impact were we getting out of the surgery? He talked about the absence of conclusive proof that the improvement noted was related to the surgery. But most of us had this belief that it really did impact things, although we really couldn't quantify it when we were talking to patients about whether you should undergo a thymectomy or not, whether you, um, uh, especially when you didn't have a tumor. If you have a tumor, you need to uh, have it taken out. If you don't mind, how many of people here had a thymectomy because they did have a thymoma? So a few of you, and so again, raise your hands if you had it with, uh, even though you didn't have a thymoma. And that's the majority of you, and that's the way it should be really, because thymomas, yes, they do occur fairly regularly in myasthenia gravis, but it's only about 10 or 15% of all patients. Okay, and so this is the next paper that I mentioned before, where he talked again about the sustained remission in that 21-year-old woman. This was uh, uh, written two years after that initial paper. And then he also started describing patients without a thymoma. And these are the results that he got in those six patients. One became symptom-free. Great. Two really significantly improved. This is before we had quantitative MG scores, and Charlene mentioned the MG ADL. This is before we had any of those types of scales. These were just sort of like the global feel of how patients did. But three of those six really did quite well. But the other three, well, one of them died, unfortunately. And two slightly improved, a little bit less clear. 75 years after this paper, there still was no conclusive evidence, what we call class one or two evidence, of what the role really was in thymectomy in this group of patients, uh, again, focusing on the ones without the tumor in their chest. Why would we think that removing the thymus gland could help in myasthenia gravis? First of all, there have been these observations, again, of patient groups that seem to have a positive response, again, lending itself to the belief that most of us had in the MG community, that it was the right thing to do, at least if you were somewhat careful in picking the patient, okay, and referring them on to the surgeon. Pathologically, a third of patients with thymoma have myasthenia gravis. So if you have a thymoma, a third of those people will have myasthenia gravis. And on the other side of things, looking at it in the reverse, 10 to 15% of patients, as I mentioned just a few uh, seconds ago, 10 to 15% of, uh, of patients with myasthenia gravis have a thymoma. So there is this type of link. And even those who don't have an actual tumor, at least if you're below, say, age 40, the majority, and this is exactly the number you'll see later that we found in the thymectomy trial as well, about two-thirds of patients have thymic follicular hyperplasia. They have an overgrowth. Um, that you can clearly see. Sometimes you can clearly uh, tell on the imaging, on the x-rays, on the chest CTs and so forth, but you can certainly quantify it with um, looking at the thymus tissue under a microscope. And then there's all these other things uh, uh, re relating to the thymus and the myasthenia gravis that have been discovered over the years, including this autoantigen. So there is a component of the acetylcholine receptor that's actually present in your thymus. And the thymus trains 
parts of our immune system, specifically the T cells, to recognize self and to be aware of non-self. So you can fight off infections and then they help B cells which make the antibodies and so forth. But there are these cells in the thymus gland that contain the sequence of, uh, of amino acids that is analogous to the main immunogenic region of the acetylcholine receptor that the antibody in myasthenia gravis responds to. It's on the alpha subunit. But in any case, um, there are cells there that contain that. And so there's a thought process, if patients have some kind of aberrant, abnormal immune response, instead of becoming tolerant to that sequence, they'll respond to it and fight it off, and that's why you build up an antibody and you get an autoimmune process going on, okay? And that's been known since the 70s, okay? And we have in our audience Dr. Lindstrom, actually, who was part of the key groups that discovered the acetylcholine receptor. He'll be speaking in the panel in just, in, in just a moment. And then there's some other pieces of evidence, again, getting down to the more microscopic uh, level, um, specifically looking at immune cells that have this thymus and myasthenia gravis link. So, in general, there's been this consensus, again, this belief, this consensus uh, in favor of doing thymectomy. It's been based on non-randomized case series, and I think most of you in the audience know to really do a proper study, you do need to ram randomize populations and have equal groups, one getting the active therapy that you're studying, and the other one getting a placebo or some kind of comparative uh, uh, of treatment. There have been repeated calls, as I mentioned in the past, to try to look at this question, and they've all failed, starting back in the 70s, again in the 80s, um, um, and then the uh, practice parameter in 2000 called for actually doing uh, 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 this type of trial, and that was also part of the stimulus in us actually getting it accomplished. And you can see actual the trial efforts in which years uh, people actually did try to organize a study and just for whatever reason they didn't happen. This is some older data and you can see this adds to this dilemma. You can see series on the left where surgical therapy, meaning thymectomy, was used and the proportion of patients who ended up having remission. Okay, and then you can see the ones that on the right who weren't treated with surgery, non-surgical therapy, they were just getting medical therapy alone. And you can see that at the bottom, if you just add up the numbers, the proportion of patients who went into remission was really not that different. 28% on the left, 24% on the right. And the, other pr uh, uh, and the other point I want to make is this is why in studies, not just the thymectomy study, this is why we use that definition of minimal manifestation status as a key outcome to get patients into minimal manifestation status and not actual remission, because the remission rates in myasthenia gravis are relatively low. You're always talking about numbers that are 10, unless you look at some of the surgical literature, but that are uh, in the surgical journals, but you're looking at rates that are like 10 or 30 percent, which is not that high a number. Whereas with minimal manifestations where the patients may still have some s signs of weakness but it's really not getting in their way, that's a much higher proportion of patients. You have a much better chance of getting patients there and from that basis being able to make a statistical comparison. Okay, again looking at some of the older studies, the lines on the top this is looking at either remission on the left in Rodriguez's study or remission or considerable improvement, which was not clearly minimal manifestation status. That definition wasn't even known about when that paper was published in 1981. That definition came about in 2000, 20 years later. But in any case, looking at these types of outcomes, you can see the lines on the top. Those are patients who had surgery. And you see what seemed to be a relatively early in the first three years, maybe four years or so. Um, and let me see where the laser pointer is on here. It's that one, right? Yeah. You can see the split from the medical therapy versus the surgical therapy, that there was a higher proportion. But then after that, it seemed to be improvement that was parallel. Both groups, whether you had surgery or not, seemed to improve around the same rate. But there was this early few years where there seemed to be quite a bit of a difference. And that then continued over time. And so, again, that also lended, these are not from randomized studies, that also lended to um, uh, the belief that um, we were actually getting some impact out of thymectomy, but not a definitive answer. If you look at Dr. Grobe's uh, um, studies from, uh, uh, this is actually the same year he passed away, in 2008, 
what I'm concentrating on, I'll just show you this real quick, because we, myasthenia gravis is a disease we've really had quite a bit of success in, in the neuromuscular field. The proportion of patients who've died, which is the dark bars, these are over different periods of time, starting in 1940, ending up around 2000. You can see the proportion of patients who've died from their disease really has gone down very nicely. And what has gone up very nicely, which is great, is patients who've improved over time. And these are significant p-values. What hasn't changed very much, and I got to this point just a, a moment ago, in the white bars are the proportion of patients who went into remission, and it really hasn't changed very much over time. It hugs around, in, this, in his hands, at least around 10%, 10, 15% or so. That doesn't change very much. Oops. Um, but what I, what I wanted to point out was really the information more on the right side. And what we see here is over time, his group found that the impact of thymectomy seemed to be decreasing as far as lending to a, uh, a remission. And he actually, at the end, in this last period of time, he actually found a slightly higher mortality, oops, and lower uh, remission in patients who had a thymectomy. It actually didn't seem to confer benefit, but you have to realize this was not randomized. He could have been sending his tougher patients, which often is what happens, his tougher patients who weren't responding to medical therapy alone to thymectomy, and their outcomes were not likely to have been as good anyway. Again, creating the need to really look at this in a formal way where you're randomizing equal types of populations, okay? Because this was not randomized. It wasn't blinded. There had been no blinded evaluations of patients after thymectomy until the study that I'll describe in a bit. Okay. Just to let you know, the thymus gland, it's not like the thyroid gland, which is actually in this picture here, right around here, but um, um, uh, right here, actually. But the thymus gland is not like the thyroid gland. It's got a bunch, I mean, there are these main lobules. You can see rest of cells. I, whoever designed the engineers who decided to make them like this is just crazy. All the black things there, though, are little collections of thymic cells. And it's really important, we think, I'll show you a slide about this at the end, to get out as much of that as you can. Okay, there's case reports and there's even some rodent data that if you do leave in a little bit of thymus, in some people that could create a less positive response, okay? And that gets to the way we actually did the thymectomy. We only allowed one type of procedure, um, which was the extended transsternal thymectomy. And um, this does involve a sternotomy. And I can tell you the centers in the study, the vast majority of them don't do it this way routinely now. They're using less invasive techniques. But if the surgeon really takes the care with a minimally inv invasive technique, whether they use a robot, a da Vinci robot or not, you can do a very, very nice thymectomy. It just, the surgeon's intent going in is to get, he needs to have the intent, or she, to get out as much uh, thymus tissue as possible. That's the key thing, okay? All right, but these are the percentages that Dr. Juretsky, who unfortunately passed away, but he was part of the study, he was a surgical chair, the proportion of tissue that comes out, uh, as far as estimates can be derived, with these different thymectomy procedures. You may ask why we didn't do the one on the top, that involves two uh, significant incisions. It's because hardly any surgeons do that. It was really something that was mostly done in Columbia University. We had to have a procedure that worldwide the surgeons were accustomed to, to be safe and to be ethical and so forth, okay. And so I just wanna go through the, the, the practice parameter briefly that Dr. Gronseth and Dr. Barron uh, uh, reported a few years ago. And what they found is comparing patients who got surgery versus medical therapy in the first column right over here, you didn't see much impact on survival, okay? But remission, there did seem to be an impact there, a two-fold greater chance of going into remission, a one and a half fold or so in, uh, a greater chance of being asymptomatic or improved. Again, in non-blinded studies, again, where medication therapy was not controlled for, patients could be getting any types of different medical therapies, of which there are quite a few in myasthenia gravis. But then you look here at this other column, the proportion of studies that had a significant p-value, where it looks statistically significant for these different types of outcomes. For instance, for remission, it was less than half of the studies that actually looked at remission where you could see that. So in the end, they recommended thymectomy as a treatment option 
in non-thymomonous myasthenia gravis, again, the MG patients who did not have myasthenia. And they asked for a control trial. A control trial was needed. And in our study, we were able to, take, to check off the top two bullet points here. We had a standard medical therapy, which was prednisone, um, using the same types of doses based on whether patients were in minimal manifestation status or not. And we used defined outcome measures. We, this was thought about early on to compare different surgical techniques that really would have been difficult to accomplish. So what we first decided to do was take a, uh, as, as maximal a thymectomy as was routinely done and see if it really did have an impact. And maybe in the future, different surgical approaches will be looked at in a formal way. They've been looked at in somewhat less formal ways. And again, most of the messages that you get from that is less invasive forms do really just as well if the surgeon's intent is to get out as much thymus tissue as possible. Okay. And so, how did we do this? And there were tons of people involved with this, and Dr. Cutter is here, and uh, um, he was uh, the director of the uh, data coordinating center that put together all the results, and uh, um, you can see other people's uh, names there, but I just want to point out that two, this study took a very long time to accomplish, and we lost two of our key leaders during the course of the study, Dr. John Newsom Davis, who really was the head of the study, um, and he passed away in 2007, and Dr. Juretsky just a couple of years ago. Okay. And we had key partners at the NIH who kept us on task and uh, were boosters of the study for the many years that it was ongoing. And you have to realize the recruitment for the study took six years. We spent six years recruiting patients. And this is not like a study, um, perhaps we're going to talk about some evolving therapies, where you can get an answer, say, in six or 12 months. Because of the way thymectomy is thought to work, we really knew we had to follow patients for three years. And that's what we did, which is a long time. Okay, and so this was the main question. Compared with prednisone alone, does the extended transdermal thymectomy with the same type of prednisone protocol result in a greater improvement in strength, and we use this quantitative MG score, lower prednisone requirements, and enhanced quality of life? And I'll give you, and I think you all know the answers. It's like t telling the plot before you see the movie. The answers was yes across that. It, it, everything fell in line uh, to, to really create a, a uh, beyond the belief, results that really show that thymectomy does have an impact in patients with myasthenia gravis who have receptor antibodies. Okay, this is the inclusion criteria, which I won't go into great detail, but just realize patients had to be between age 18 and 65. They couldn't have disease more than five years. We did extend those to the age and the duration a little bit to improve recruitment about two years into the trial. It was not easy. It's not easy to recruit studies to recruit patients to many MG studies, so we allowed for that. Uh, some slight changes there. And obviously, they couldn't have a thymectomy, and we had excluded rituximab and a few other things. Okay. And again, without going through details, the only difference in this trial over the three years occurred in the first couple of weeks, basically. Did patients get a thymectomy or not? And since it was randomized, patients did not decide that. The computer decided it. The doctors didn't decide it. It was done by a computerized, randomized system. So patients had to have a lot of trust to go into that because whatever the computer spit it out, basically in two weeks, they had to undergo a major surgical procedure. And uh, we had all these different outcome measures. And instead of talking about them now, I'll just show you the results as they, uh, on the subsequent slides. All right. And uh, the NIH actually made us really think about this. It's hard to get NIH money, especially for clinical trials. And so we ended up with this dual primary outcome. Um, you can imagine a scenario where perhaps the thymectomy group and the medical therapy group would end up looking the same as far as strength, but that could have been at the cost of more prednisone, for instance, on the side of the medication therapy alone. So we all, in addition to looking at just strength outcomes, we wanted to look at the exposure from prednisone, and we also wanted to have a good look at adverse events from corticosteroids. And Charlene, just before, spoke, uh, uh, made some points about all the different bad things that can occur with steroids, and many of you have experienced that in your own life. And so we wanted to see also what kind of impact thymectomy would have, not just on the dose of steroids, but on the potential side effects that steroids often create. Before we started the study, we asked the doctors involved what they thought it would show. 
And this was sealed until the very end, after we got the responses. And you can, you can see the majority of people, and again, these are centers that were commonly doing thymectomy. We could only use those types of centers that were well-versed at doing it to be safe and ethical and so forth. So you can see out of the 133 responses, just over half did feel, in the end, we would find that thymectomy would, uh, that there would be a favorable response to thymectomy. But obviously, that left a pretty large minority that did not feel either that the use of thymectomy would lead to a favorable outcome or just weren't sure. So there really was a, you know, a split opinion of what we might end up finding. But the majority, a small, a small majority, 77 out of 133, did feel like um, the trial would lead to uh, showing benefits. And so, again, the paper was published uh, last August and we're still, we, there's gonna be more papers coming out from data that was collected during the trial. This was a huge effort. There were 280 authors on this paper. <laughs> uh, and I did that all myself. I didn't even trust it to a secretary. Part of that was uh, uh, in tribute to Fred and John. But um, <laughs> it was tough keeping track of everybody, making sure everybody's names were spelled correctly. There were 49 main authors, though, and then another 250 listed in an appendix. Um, the uh, enrollment, it took us six years, 2006 to 2012. It was fairly steady, and then at the end, I think people had exhausted either themselves or their patient population. So it did decline a little bit in the rate of accrual, but it was not easy to find patients. But we ended up with 126. And this was done with an intent to treat analysis. That meant humans being humans, even if they agreed to go in the study and said, yes, I will abide by whatever the decision was, we had an equal number of patients who ended up um, getting randomized to thymectomy. We had eight who then refused to have it done. Humans are humans, it's okay. That's what researchers expect to some degree. And then we had eight who had a thymectomy outside the protocol after they were randomized to the non-thymectomy group. But it just worked out that those numbers were equal. But the way you analyze the data is actually if, if they actually did what they were supposed to do. That's the proper way to do the analysis. We didn't have a lot of dropouts. We had a lot fewer dropouts than we expected, which was good from a statistical and power standpoint for the study. Okay, why did patients get excluded? A lot of patients got excluded. We screened thousands of patients, several thousand, to get to the 126. And um, onset and age were the two main ones. But the one right after that, which we thought we can't impact onset and age. It is what it is. But at some points we thought during the course of the trial to be more permissive of other therapies besides prednisone that patients could be on when they went in, but we decided to hold fast because things like azathioprine and mycophenolate and so forth can really cloud the results because the impact of that, of those drugs can take a long time to see. That could impact what we ended up finding. So we held fast. The only thing patients could go in on was mestinon and prednisone, okay? And then these numbers here, percentages, will add up to more than 100 because some patients had more than one reason why they were excluded. This is what we ended up with. This was the randomized population. There are a few things in red here I just want to point out. The majority of the patients were female, which is fairly typical, at least in somewhat younger groups of myasthenia gravis. The average age, and this was younger, the average age was in their 30s. Okay, so it was female predominant in their 30s, disease duration of about a year, even though we allowed it up to five years, but a year, and a quantitative MG score of about 12 in both groups. But none of these were of any significant difference. Uh, about three quarters of the patients went in on steroids. So we had a relatively small number of patients who were steroid free, who had not been exposed to steroids when they were randomized. We allowed it either way, but three quarters were on steroids. This is the first outcome data that, I, that I'm showing here. The uh, quantitative MG score, the lower your score, the better that you're doing. The quantitative MG score went down significantly fairly early, somewhat earlier than we uh, might have thought, and realized the first real data we could really hang on to from a blinded perspective was at four months because we had non-blinded evaluators for the first few months, three months, to allow patients to recover from surgery, okay? Because we didn't want to expose the blinded evaluators and have them get a clue of what the actual procedure the patient had was. We were blinded. The patients weren't blinded, but the evaluators needed to be blinded to do this properly. But you can see the separation that continued for the three years as far as a lower QMG, which is improved, improved status, which is a better status, functional status. This is the prednisone dosing. 
Now, because of the protocol, it had to go up initially. But then here, again, thymectomy plus prednisone, the prednisone requirements were significantly reduced by thymectomy as well, okay? And this is, these are in your handouts, and it's a bunch of small numbers. I'm just going to point out a few of the things in red. But when we looked at the time weight, the average prednisone needs over those three years averaged out on an every other day basis, um, what we found was that the, um, the requirement for thymectomy was about 30 milligrams versus about 55 milligrams if you did not have a thymectomy. All right, that's every other day. That's more prednisone than we want you guys in this room on, okay? But you have to realize, and doctor, this came up yesterday when Dr. Uh, Pulley was speaking about, realize patients had to be in minimal manifestation status. If not, we had to go up on their prednisone by protocol. And so we were a little bit tighter and probably pushed prednisone harder than what would routine, routinely be done in practice, okay? But this still did show a significant reduction. The other reason I think that prednisone doses at the end of three years were somewhat higher than what we would like in conventional practice is because we did not use immunosuppressive agents except with very tight requirements. Patients couldn't be on them at all until a year into the study, and they had to have significant side effects or not be in minimal manifestation status over that year period of time before they could be on them. We use non-steroid immunosuppressants like azathioprine, mycophenolate, uh, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, uh, 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 methotrexate. We use them much more liberally in routine practice when you see your doctors than we were allowed to use in this trial. People had to stick to the protocols in this study. Okay, a few of the other things. We even found benefits depending on whether you're looking at the steroid dose or the quantitative MG score in patients who were male, for instance, in older patients. We were able to tease that out. There did seem, and we're looking at this still more, more fully, but there did seem to be an impact. It wasn't just people below 40 who you could potentially benefit from thymectomy. It wasn't only women, because that had somewhat been mentioned in the past in older studies that women responded better than men and so forth. Anyway we saw a more generalized response. Okay, and just a few of the other th outcomes besides the main ones included, for instance, the MGADL, which at least at 12 and 24 months was significantly better if you had a thymectomy. Things like the proportion of patients who were minimal manifestation status, it was also significantly higher at every single year point, one, two, and three years, if you had a thymectomy. But I want to point out this, because this came up yesterday. I was asked, uh, I think Bob uh, um, asked me, why you see so much negative stuff about thymectomy on Facebook or other social media. Look at this. Even at three years, only two-thirds of the patients who had thymectomy were in minimal manifestation status at that time point. There's always going to be non-responders to thymectomy. Now, that doesn't mean some patients beyond that 67%, maybe another 10 or 20%, did have some improvement. But at least using that formal definition of a response of minimal manifestation status or better, it was 67%. Yes, it was higher than the prednisone alone group, but this wasn't 95 or 100%. That's what it is. Okay, but it still was significantly higher. Hospitalization requirements were reduced as well. Okay, this is looking at side effects. I won't dwell on this too long, but again, thymectomy conferred benefits from the standpoint of fewer hospitalizations, fewer numbers of side effects, uh, uh, less uh, uh, severity of those side effects and so forth um, because of lesser prednisone requirements. Okay, and this gets to that point as well. Treatment-associated symptoms, it was a survey, mostly dealing with steroid-related side effects. But um, looking at it in a variety of ways, the number of patients who had at least one uh, um, um, symptom of a side effect, the mean number of side effects, the distress levels, you see values here less than 0.05 most of the time showing a benefit from thymectomy on reducing the side effect burden that patients experience from medications. A few of our things did not work out. This is a general health survey, the SF36. We didn't see any clear difference between thymectomy and non-thymectomy groups, but in any case, the vast majority of the data did point in this one direction. I mentioned this before. We're still looking at the, uh, uh, the thymus gland samples that Alex Marks in Germany, our colleague there, who's the expert in thymus pathology in the world, 
67%, I gave that number before, about two-thirds of these patients did have evidence of thymic follicular hyperplasia. Obviously, they couldn't have a thymoma. Thymoma patients were excluded from the study. Although one patient was found to have a thymoma unexpectedly uh, um, when the uh, um, pathology was done. Okay, just the thymectomy trial in context. Um, I think there's going to be adjustments to these types of languages uh, and these sentences in future uh, uh, renditions of different treatment recommendations, including this thing called the Cochrane Collaboration. This was an effort I was involved with, <coughs> excuse me, the International MG Treatment uh, Recommendation Statement that again came out last year in neurology that Don Sanders and I helped organize. And uh, there we framed it as an option to potentially avoid or minimize the dose or duration of immunotherapy. I'm speaking about thymectomy and non thymomatous MG. I think we can strengthen that language um, uh, uh, in the next rendition of this based on the New England paper. This gets to other surgical techniques. I've already spoken about this, but this was a group in uh, Taiwan that compared a minimally invasive to the extended transdermal, which is what we used in, this in the trial that I've been describing. They got similar weights out of thymic tissue, so they seemed to get a similar amount out. But the morbidity in the hospital, time in the hospital, duration of needing painkillers, it's improved. It's better with minimally invasive techniques, where they can go through the side between the ribs instead of basically cracking your chest bone in half, okay? So, again, the intent of the surgeon is key here. And this gets to the point, um, if you have thymic tissue in other areas, uh, um, your chance of getting improvement from thymectomy is reduced. And so it's really important that the surgeon try to get out as much tissue as possible. This is only one of the lines of evidence. Uh, there's others that also kind of tell you the same story. Okay, the proportion of patients getting thymectomy has gone down in the United States, at least in data through around the 2005. This is the proportion of emissions for myasthenia gravis for thymectomy. It had gone down from 7 to 1.5 percent. We think that's related to two things. One, some people were waiting for results of the trial. The other thing is um, we have more and more medications all the time to play with in myasthenia gravis, perhaps pushing thymectomy back. But we believe the study should, again, place thymectomy higher up in the decision-making process in patients who have receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis. Okay. And so this is the summary. We saw benefits from thymectomy across several lines. The clinical outcomes based on this quantitative MG score, steroid exposure, side effects. The effects seem to be starting even in less than a year's time. And future investigations you can read down there, but we're especially hoping to predict if thymic histology gives us a window of what that patient may end up doing after thymectomy. All right, we got to thank several people here, all the study subjects. These were the investigators. We had two investigator meetings in 2006 as we were kicking this off, and there's Dr. Newsom Davis in the front, and uh, Fred is there as well, Fred Jaretsky. Um, but we have to thank the patients. They put a lot of faith in us, and they had to stick with us for three years. They had to give up their own decision-making of whether to have a major surgical procedure or not. That's not easy for anybody to do. Again, the MGFA, they got it started. 